God is faithful. He knows where you're at. He doesn't need a GPS to get to you. Amen, amen, amen. So, <clears throat> this morning, we're starting a new series, and it's called Headlines. So, for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about things that, some current events, some things that are going on in our world today, that we feel like need to be addressed, uh, so that we know, uh, as Christians, we know how to respond. Amen? Uh, you know, in the early days of our country, pastors were more than just ministers of the gospel. They ministered the gospel, but they also spread news because they, because they talked about things that were happening and how God's people should respond to those things. And so we believe... Uh, I show you that this, this message is approved by Pastor Stu. <laughs> um, he's a smart pastor. He loves you, and he doesn't want you hurt by me or anybody else. So don't get nervous. Some of you may get nervous in this message today, but that's okay. Just look straight ahead and smile. Nobody will know you're nervous. Amen. God loves you. I love you, and I, I want you to know that my heart for this for this message is not condemnation or anger or retribution. My heart is compassion and love. I love you and I love the people around me everywhere I go because I know that they are just like me. They either once were a sinner and now they've been saved by grace. By grace, I mind you. Not by their works. Or they're saved by grace just like I am, and they just don't think the way I do. You know what? It's okay. People are valuable. Relationships are the key, most, uh, the most important thing on this planet. Your relationship with God being the most important. So how many of you would agree with me that there's some things going on in our nation today that need to stop? Anybody? <laughs> There's some weird stuff happening. <laughs> I mean, there's some things that just I don't even understand why they're happening. Um, well, I, I know why they're happening. The devil's a bad devil. But uh, one of the most troubling things that's happening in our nation is that Christianity is declining rapidly. I mean, <laughs> faster than we want to admit as pastors and people who go to church. Uh, the Barner Group is a research group uh, that does a lot of, um, they're a Christian research group, and they do a lot of studying about the church. And they released uh, this um, report called The State of the Church 2020, in which they reported on data that they had collected over the last 20 years in surveys. Uh, it was over 96,000 surveys that they had done over the last 20 years, and they, they did a deep dive and pulled out some information uh, from these surveys, and one of the things that they found was that only one in four Christians is what they define as a, uh, no, only one in four people, Americans, this is just Americans, this is not about the whole world, one, one in four Americans is what they define as a practicing Christian. That's a low number, um, especially in a nation who's well, this is a low number. Now, that's a problem, but the, for me, a more troubling thing is how much the Barner Group has had to lower the bar to get it that high. Because listen to how they define a practicing Christian. <clears throat> number one, you identify yourself as a Christian. You self-identify as a Christian. When they ask you, are you a Christian? You say, yes, I'm a Christian. Number two, when they ask you how important faith is in your life, you say very important. And the third one is that you attend church at least once a month. <laughs> well, 
That once seriously, once a month as a practicing Christian? Now I'm not I'm not hurt, I'm not attacking anyone. I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just saying that in years past, a person who attended church once a month would never have been considered a practicing Christian. I mean, being at church is not about checking a box. It's about hearing the word and being around other believers who can help you with your life. It's about a community. We're all trying to do the same thing. We're all following Jesus. And there are people in that community that have been following Jesus longer than I have and have learned some things I haven't learned yet. And you know what? If I listen to them, I won't have to go through the stuff they went through to learn it. You don't have to learn from the school of hard knocks. It is a school that will teach you a lot, but it's also a school that will kill you. And we don't have to learn that way. So in their polling, the Barna Group found that 80% of American adults across age groups, ethnicities, gender, socioeconomic status, and political ideology are concerned about the nation's moral condition. 80%, that's a good number. 80%, that's pretty strong. At least a lot of people realize that there's something wrong. Right? I mean, I like that. But the problem is that just knowing something's wrong doesn't fix the problem. And, you know, it's kind of like being in an airplane that's nose down, diving for the earth from 50,000 feet, and taking a pole and knowing, every, you know, 80% of the people on the plane agree that something's wrong. Well, I don't care if they agree that something's wrong or not. I want somebody that knows how to fix it, right? I mean, I want that thing fit. I don't want that plane going down. I know I'm going to heaven, but I don't want to do it in a plane crash. Amen. Yeah, that's just true. I want to do it just relaxing at my home, sitting in my favorite chair, and say, bye, I'm gone. I don't know about you, but, you know, it's important to me how I leave this earth. I want to leave a testimony of a man, as, he, as the Bible says, a man after God's heart. A man who walked with God. So the Barner Group also found that 44% of American adults believe that moral truth is relative to circumstances. And that that number only goes up as you go down in age. Moral truth is relative to circumstances. And that's a problem. That's a problem. But an even bigger problem is that only 59% of practicing Christians disagreed with that statement. Hello. Hello. That means that 41% of the practicing Christians that they surveyed think that moral truth is relative to what you're going through. There are no absolutes that are 100% right 100% of the time. That's a problem. People calling themselves Christians who don't believe that God has set things in order and they are the way, they're that way because of, that's the way God wants them. There is right and there is wrong? Wow. So how do we get to this point? Let me go back in time a little bit. Uh, John Adams, who was one of our founding fathers, and he became the third president of the United States, he said, our Constitution was made for moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the government, the, the governing of any other. Our first president and founding father, George Washington, said, it is impossible to rightly govern without the Bible. I guess I should have had him put these quotes up, but I didn't think about it. James Madison said, another of the founding fathers and the fourth U.S. president, he said, we have staked the future of our nation upon the capacity of each and all to govern, control, and sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Amen. I'm not, a, I'm not a big Ten Commandment guy. But you know what? If that's what people respond to, 
I'm all for it. There's just more. <laughs> a ship called the Mayflower set out from Plymouth, England on September 6, 1620 with 102 passengers. The Mayflower was loaded with a group of Puritans called Separatists. Uh, they were bound for the English colony of Virginia where the Separatists believed that they could worship God the, the way they wanted to without interference from the government-run Church of England. As far as I know, none of our founding fathers were Puritans. Uh, I do know that Benjamin Franklin came from a Puritan family, but he, did not, he was not a practicing Puritan. He grew up in the Puritan church, though. So. Um, I do believe that many of our founding fathers were Christians. Matter of fact, we'll get to that in a minute, but I think probably most of them. Uh, but there's some argument about that. The fact is that 56 men signed the United States Declaration of Independence, and of those 56, there's only four that are in dispute of whether they were Christians or not. Now, that seems pretty insignificant. It doesn't sound like what you hear out there on the news in the world. There's only four of them that are in dispute. The rest of them are undeni were undeniably Christians. There were 55 signatures to the U.S. Constitution, and of those, 51 of them were clearly and unashamedly members of local churches, of, you know, a known denomination. There is overwhelming evidence that at least 93% of our founding fathers here in the United States were believers. Don't worry, I'm not just going to talk about, I'm, we're going to talk about the Bible. I knew y'all were going to get nervous about this. I'm just sitting the stage here. Another indisputable truth is that 98% of the revolution generation were Protestant Christians. So the founding fathers and nearly all of the revolution generation were people with a shared Judeo-Christian worldview and ethics. Now, whether four of the founding fathers were Christians or not, I think is really insignificant. I don't think it matters. I think you can find, well, I don't think. I've done a lot of study on this. I know you can find documents where they seem to be Christians and documents where they don't seem to be Christians. But it is still undeniable that the Founding Fathers and the framers of our Constitution, the writers of our Declaration of Independence, the people who were in the early days of this nation formed this nation, had more influence from the Bible and from Christianity than any nation on the planet. The Book of Deuteronomy was probably looked to in the formation of the United States uh, more than any other book in the Bible. And I want to read you a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 9, where God's speaking through Moses to the children of Israel upon the, the initial founding of that nation. God said through Moses, He said, Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations just as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may obey them in the land that you're about to enter and occupy. Obey them completely, and you'll display your wisdom and intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these decrees, they'll exclaim, How wise and prudent are the people of this great nation! For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on Him? I love that. And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as the body of instruction that I am giving you today. But then in verse 9, he changes his tenor a bit. He says, but watch out. Be careful never to forget what you yourselves have seen. Don't let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live and be sure to pass them on to your children and your grandchildren. God was telling Moses and the leaders of Israel 
as you're about to establish yourself as a nation, as you're about to come into the promises of God, I'm going to put my hand on you. He said the nations around are going to look at you and they're going to say, wow, they're going to be astonished at your wisdom and your prudence because you're following my precepts, my commandments. And they'll bring a righteous lifestyle. Then in verse 9, God warned them, didn't he? He warned them. What did God say to them? He said, first of all, he said, don't forget. Oh, brother. You know, in the children of Israel, God told the children of Israel 240 times to remember. You know why? Because that was their worst problem. Things would get going good, and they would forget who got them there. They would forget who was taking care of them. They would forget who it was that sustained their lives. And I believe it's the same. I think we got the same problem today. I mean, I don't, people are people, right? I don't care how many thousands of years ago it was. We, the biggest problem for Christians today is things get to going good and we forget. Amen. We feel like we did it. We worked hard, you know. We did it. We, we were there, blah, blah, blah. And it's all God helping us, working through us. Without Him, we'd have nothing. Without Him, we'd be nothing. But you know what? We're not without Him, praise God. <laughs> so then God told them why He didn't want them to forget, right? He told them, I don't want you to forget because I want you to pass this on to your children and your grandchildren. Now listen, if you haven't been doing that in your life, relax, nobody's mad at you, okay? Don't sit there and go, Ooh, he's talking about me. It's okay. We all make mistakes, all right? But we can change. In the context of these verses, God's telling the children of Israel to remember him and what he's done for them so they can pass it on. Because eventually they won't be here anymore. Hello. Hey, the ultimate statistic is 10 out of 10 die, folks. It, it, relax. Everybody's going to die. We've got life. We're never, we're, gonna, we're just going to change clothes. <laughs> if you're a believer, you got nothing to be afraid of. There is no unknown. God will reveal to you when you need to know. Now, <laughs> it doesn't take a mental giant to figure out that one of the reasons our nation sits on the precipice of the abyss, one of the reasons why uh, some Americans... <laughs> Can't tell which public restroom to use. And, and, and I mean, it, it is kind of funny, but I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, it's just what's happening in our, in our nation. One of the reasons why a female Supreme Court justice doesn't know what a woman is, one of the reasons, and I think probably the main reason, why 41% of American Christians surveyed that qualifies practicing Christians say that there are, no, there are no moral absolutes is because over the last 50 or 60 years, many who have called themselves Christians have not been careful to live their lives like Christians and pass what God's done for them and through them on to their children and grandchildren. And we now have a nation of people who, you know, young, the younger people, look, I'm 50... Four? Yeah. I'm 50. I, 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 sorry. I, I just don't. I didn't matter. I'm 54. You know, I'm just going to get older or I'm going to go to heaven. That's the two choices, right? I mean, both are good. Um, so I'm 54. People who are younger than me and now I have to say much younger than me, you know, like 30 and down. Uh, there's a, most of them have never even been in church. I'm talking about the majority of them now. This is, this is proven out. I'm not, this is not some number I'm pulling out of thin air. You know, there's this idea, uh, postulate in physics, that's attributed to Aristotle, and so nature abhors a vacuum. And, and, uh, now, this is very simplistic, so Alan, don't kill me, uh, because I know Alan knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, in a simplistic way, to say that, it, you're just saying that, that emptiness is always going to be filled. 
And this isn't only true for the most part in physics, but it's also true when it comes to biblical authority. As used in the New Testament, authority is the right to use power or the legitimate use of power. Adam gave this right to the devil on this planet, but Jesus gave it back to us. The second Adam. He did it right. Praise God. The devil will step into a void of authority where someone is not using their authority. He'll step into it every time and take over. James 4, 7 reads, uh, Submit or humble yourselves to God and resist the devil. Right? If you do it, he'll flee from you, it says. If we don't resist the devil, not only will he not flee, but he will keep pushing and filling the gap until somebody stops him. In Judges chapter 2, verse 10, this verse, there's a verse that reads, After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he, do, he had done for Israel. Folks, I believe with all my heart that's where we are today in the United States. There's a generation that has come up, and it's nobody's fault but the church. Mind you, we can't blame it on anyone else. It's not the devil's fault. All he did was, when we weren't doing anything, jump in there and do his thing. If there's anything about the devil, he's persistent. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples uh, were in the temple courts in Jerusalem, and on their way out of the, uh, the disciples, they just wouldn't shut up about how awesome the temple building was and how what craftsmanship was used to build it. I mean, and, and in, in, in Matthew 24, too, Jesus turned to them as they were going on and on and on. And he said, uh, Jesus said to them, look, boys, take a good look at these things around you, at these buildings. <laughs> I'm telling you that there will not be one stone left on top of another. It will all be leveled. And apparently, they were discussing this comment on their commute by foot back to Bethany. Because when they got back there, uh, <laughs> they asked Jesus some questions about it. I mean, they just couldn't wait. Oh, man, what was he talking about? Dude, I don't know. What's oh, man, that's crazy. Because this was so awesome. This was a, a, a work of art. It was a feat of building uh, architectural beauty. I mean, the temple was awesome. <laughs> and so they asked him, they said, well, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the supernatural sign that we should expect that will signal your coming and the completion of this age? Now, Jesus spends the rest of that chapter answering those three questions, and we're not going to read it all. And you said, oh, thank God. Um, but, but I do want to skim through a few verses. Uh, Jesus is talking about what the time, what the end, the last days, the end of the age, what that time will look like. And the first thing he tells them is that deception will be out of control. And leaders will be leading people astray. Sounds familiar? I don't know how many of you have noticed. Uh, you know, I used to always say that, uh, you know, people who aren't born again, uh, they're just going to do what they do, you know. And, and listen, I don't, I'm not condemning them. They are, they just don't know. You know, I, I want to say, they, they'll lie to you uh, if it's to their advantage. They'll take things if it's to their advantage, and it doesn't bother them because they don't know better. They're of their father. That's what Jesus said. I'm not the one who said that. Jesus said that. Their father is Satan, and they're of their father. Right? So they're going to do what he does. But, you know, I sure have noticed over the last many years uh, that it's not just unbelievers. It's not just unbelievers that will tell you a lie looking to you in the face. 
I've had a lot of Christians lie to me. I mean, just a bald-faced lie right in my face. And it's sad. It's a shame. I'm not mad at them. I'm not condemning them to hell. I'm not judging them. Oh, we love to throw that verse up. Judge not, least ye be judged. I'm not condemning them to hell, but I'm saying that what they're doing is wrong. That's not judging them. That's comparing what they're doing to the Scriptures. I don't have animus in my heart against them. (laughs) All right, amen. I knew you were going to love this. Uh, (laughs) And Jesus says, after he tells them that there's going to be a lot, that, that, you know... uh, Deception is going to be out of control and people are going to be leading them astray. He tells them some other good news uh, that followers of his are going to be persecuted and killed. Woo! Praise God! I don't, that's not like a life verse for me. How about you? I mean, no. Um, you know. And then he says, many will fall away. Many will leave. They'll stop following Jesus. Looks familiar to me. And then in verse 12, he says this, there will be such an increase of sin and lawlessness that those whose hearts once burned with passion for God and others will grow cold. Now, that's a problem that the people who are growing cold, that's an issue that they're going to have to resolve because they're not committed. Now, now I can't say that I'm a speed limit guy. (laughs) You know, my... Traffic ticket record would show that. Um, I'm not, but I drive safely. And occasionally I do something stupid behind the wheel. Okay? I mean, I think all of you can relate to that. Everybody does something dumb every once in a while, right? I can say that as I've gotten older, those dumb things have become less and less. Thank God. Now, one thing I've noticed over the last six to eight months is how many people are running red lights. Have anybody else noticed that? I mean, I'm not talking about the guy who's trying to beat the yellow, get through on the yellow. I'm not talking about that guy. I'm talking about after it's red and you've waited a beat, a car will go through. Has anybody anybody noticed that besides me? I mean, it's uh, it's like at epidemic levels, in my opinion. And I'm to the point where when the light turns green, I look to see if it looks like somebody coming to the light's not going to stop. And I can tell you that over the last couple of months, I would have been T-boned at a high rate of speed at least twice if I hadn't done that. I mean, it is crazy. I believe that that is just a small uh, symptom of this lawlessness that Jesus was talking about. We're definitely seeing many Christians stop following Jesus. Definitely seeing that. Not only that, but but we've now reached a point, like I mentioned earlier, where a large percentage of the American youth have never even been in a church. They don't even know anything about Christianity. They just know what somebody's told them. The United States has sent out more missionaries than any nation in history, but today we send out less, we are not the number one missionary sending country in the world anymore. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you folks. It's not all going to be doom and gloom, trust me. Christianity is rapidly declining in the United States, and there is a religion that's filling the gap. Now, don't get mad at me, but that religion is called social justice. Today's social justice movement says that the United States isn't great at all. It says that the United States is a nation that has been systematically built on the backs of disenfranchised, powerless minorities. Today's social justice movement points to the fact that slavery was legal in the United States, and it says that is unforgivable. 
Today's social justice movement points to the founding fathers who wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they call them self-serving liars who were only out for their own good because many of them were slave owners. Today's social justice movement, and I say today's social justice movement because social justice, the, the term social justice, when it was, it was coined and the movement that came that was, you know, that name was put on when it started was not all bad. It started in the Catholic Church with them being concerned about the way people were living. I think we should be concerned about that. With the way people are being mistreated, I think we should be concerned about that. But it's changed. Today's social justice movement says that the only way to fix the problem is to utterly destroy America's social, governmental, and societal framework and start over. Today's social justice movement says that the only answer is revolution. No half measures. Justice demands that the power must be transferred from white, straight men to black brown, queer, transgender, gay, and lesbian women who by nature of their existence are oppressed. Today in our nation, there is a growing religion called social justice, and it is rapidly replacing Christianity. Younger Americans have almost exclusively embraced this religion. They wouldn't call it a religion. But they are fanatically adhered to the teachings of social justice. Entire Christian denominations, well-known Christian pastors, leaders, speakers, and churches full of people have been deceived by today's social justice movement. A fundamental change, folks, began in the thinking of many Americans back in the 1960s. And it became known as postmodernism. And, you know, if this is boring, I'm sorry, but I just got to set the stage for you here before we get to the good stuff. Postmodernism, by design, is very difficult to define and even harder to summarize. But, you know, in general, it stands on four pillars. Human, a human identity is made up of cultural forces outside of themselves. In other words, uh, society makes you who you are, tells you who you are. Relativism, there is no absolute truth. Deconstruction, which is tearing down everything traditional and starting over. Changing the meanings of, of, of words because the old meanings obviously are bad. And globalization, which simply means that all boundaries are oppressive. There shouldn't be any boundaries. We should be able to do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do. Sounds like chaos to me, but that's all right. Out of postmodernism came, to, came what today is known simply as theory. And out of theory, in our time, social justice has marched to the forefront. Now, I don't have time to get into this very deeply, so... If you want to learn about it, do what I've done. Read. Uh, John Stone Street, the president of Colson Center for Christian Worldview, likes to say it's no good having the same vocabulary if you have a different dictionary. And one of the things you'll find when you're dealing with social justice warriors, as they call themselves, is that the words you're saying are not the words they're hearing. And the words they're saying to you are not, they don't mean the same thing. Because they've redefined them. Social justice warriors today say social justice means fair treatment of all people in society, including respect for the rights of minorities and equitable distribution of resources among members of the community. Well, who decides what's fair? Who decides what's equitable? Who decides who, uh, who's going to distribute these resources? And my last question is, Whose resources are you distributing? 
because there's a limited amount. Well, it should be, it should be redistributing, not distributing. Because what they want to do is take my resources and give them to somebody else. Because that's fair in their mind. You know, fair is synonymous with justice. And this is another term that has been redefined by this movement. They define justice as the tearing down of traditional structures and systems deemed to be oppressive and the redistribution of power and resources from oppressors to victims in pursuit of equality of outcome. Not equality of opportunity, but equality of outcome. Psalms 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. God's throne is set up on two pillars, righteousness and justice. And if you look at the Scripture, you'll find that these words are used interchangeably very often. The Hebrew words, you don't care what they are, but the, uh, the Hebrew words for righteousness and justice are different de depending on the context of the verse. Righteousness is living right, conforming to God's code of conduct. You know, justice is doing right. Righting wrongs of society, defending the poor, the orphans, the widows, the marginalized of society. But notice that neither one of these definitions have anything to do with outcome or anything to do with how you feel. God's Word is not based on feelings. God's Word is sure, it's true, it's solid. It is a place you can build a successful life, a foundation that you can build a successful life on. The Bible was written thousands of years ago, folks, and it's still true today. What's happened is the righteousness, righteousness is living right, and unfortunately in America, what's happened is that we, we've come up with this concept of justice without righteousness. And it's impossible. You know, righteousness deals with things like sexual orientation, marriage, abortion, character. So many people today have been deceived into thinking that either that because, of, because society has changed its opinion about these things, God's Word must have changed, or they just don't care what God's Word says. The truth is, folks, God's Word has not changed, and it's the only thing that matters. We've got to learn to walk the fine line of loving people but telling them the truth without seeming like, hey, I got it all together and it's you unclean to have to get right. That's self-righteousness. Nobody likes that. Christians define justice as doing right and we define right as doing things God's way. I don't define what's right. God defines what's right. It doesn't matter how I feel about it what I think about it, what my opinion is, has nothing to do with it. If God said it, it's right. And look, my, my issue with the social justice movement of today isn't that, you know, it's young people like it and I'm an older person and I don't, get off my lawn. You know, it's not, that's not what it is. It, it, it's that this is not biblical. The ideas are anti-Christ. The DNA of, these, of this movement is to ignore Jesus. So, I mean, how do we respond to this? Hmm. Well, there's, I want to give you three suggestions. All right? Number one, protect yourself from deception. Colossians 2.8 reads, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. All of you have heard of a group called Black Lives Matter. I'm not picking on them, okay? Because you know what? For a group of black people to stand up and say, you know what, I feel like in this country my life doesn't matter. You know, that's their right. They have that right because of the country we live in. And you know what? If that's the way they feel, that's the way they feel. I can't say, you shouldn't feel that way. You don't feel that way. 
you know what? I, any more than I can tell you, you shouldn't feel the way you feel. It's the way you feel. Amen. But you can't base your life on feelings because it is very unstable. Because the way you feel today won't be the way you feel tomorrow. Matter of fact, the way you feel right now might not be the same in five minutes. You, we all know that. We all know that. I'm not going to argue with them. Justice demands that I value the people involved in that movement, the leaders of that movement as human beings. Because justice is doing right. It's doing what God says. And they are human beings, and that means they're valuable in God's eyes. And if they're valuable in God's eyes, as a follower of Christ, they must be valuable in my eyes. There's a lot of layers of deception with this group. None of it matters. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. It doesn't mean I have to agree with them to love them, but what it means is I do have to love them. And I love people with the way I talk to them, the way I talk about them, and the way I treat them. How can Christians avoid being deceived? Well, number one, you have to compare all ideas and all thoughts to the Bible and see if they're true. Because the Bible is true. Pray and ask God for wisdom when you're dealing with these kinds of things. Number two, find out what God's purpose for you is and get busy fulfilling that purpose. This is a way you will not be deceived because if you're busy fulfilling your purpose for God, you're not going to be listening to all kind of crazy stuff because you've got a mission. <laughs> you know, like the Blues Brothers said, we're on a mission from God. You will actually be on a mission from God. They weren't, but you will be. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 19 tells us that we've got to look at people the way God looks at them. We can't look at them the way other humans look at each other because we're not just like that anymore. We now have God living inside of us. What purpose do you have in life? Well, I can tell you the very first purpose of every believer is to be a minister of reconciliation, not a minister of division. There's a bunch of ministers of division out there. Just turn the TV on. Amen. We are to reconcile people to Christ and reconcile people to each other. That's our very first mission in life. You say, well, I thought it was, you know, telling people about Jesus. That's how you do it. You tell them how God accepted you when you were against him, when you didn't care about him, and he still accepted you. And you know what? I'll accept you too, even though you don't think like me, you don't look like me, you don't dress like me, you got tattoos from head to toe, and I don't have any. Even though you're pierced in every place you can be pierced in, and I'm not pierced at all, I still value you. I still see you. I still acknowledge that you exist and you're important. Whether you're homeless or you're an addict, whether you're, you're mentally, in, you know, you're legal, you're certifiable, it makes no difference. You're a person and you need love. It's, it's my responsibility to love those people. It's your responsibility to love those people. And number three, make sure that the way you treat others is the way Jesus treats you. Whoo! And everybody said, hey! <laughs> Philippians 2, 1 through 5, talks about this. It says to have the same mindset as Christ when you're in relationship with people. What do they need? That's what Jesus was always thinking about. Jesus wasn't always thinking about what he wanted. You think he wanted to stay up all night praying? No. You think he wanted to go to the cross? Absolutely not. His flesh did not want to. Yes, he wanted to follow God's, God's plan. Absolutely. But his flesh didn't want to. His humanness said, hey, wait a minute. God, if there's any other way. 
The Bible does not promote using people to get what you want. Did you hear what I said? That is not a godly attribute. The Bible does not promote people behaving like helpless victims either. Because there is a way out. With every temptation, there is a way out. You know why he says that? Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It's not because you're not, God's not going to put more on you than you can bear. You can bear anything with Christ. The Bible teaches me that whoever I come across, whoever I see in my life, my job is to show them Jesus. I do that by the way I talk to them, by the way I treat them, by the things I say and don't say. I do that by the, by the things I don't post. Amen. Look, Christians have got to stop getting on social media and dividing people. Stop it. That's, that's not God. We're supposed to be bringing people together. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everybody. Loving them is not agreeing with them all the time when they're wrong. And you know, you know how I know if they're wrong or not? It's because of what the Bible says. Not because of my opinion. I compare what they're saying to what the Word says, and if it doesn't agree, they're wrong. I'm sorry. I'm not mad at them. It's just a fact. You know what the answer to our, the division and strife in our world today is? It's Jesus Christ. And there is no other answer. There is no political party. There is no program. There is no number of votes that's going to change the problems in our nation today. It's never going to happen. If you're looking to the government to do it, you need to stop because you're being deceived. Jesus is the answer, and He is the only answer. He loves America, He loves Americans. Amen. Oh, yeah, we've done some things wrong in this nation. Absolutely. But God still loves us. And His hand is still on this nation. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Why would He take His hand off? He's not angry with anybody. He's not adding up your faults, your mistakes, your sins. Let me leave you with this verse. Micah 6, 8. It says... He's shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does God require of you, or Jehovah, but for you to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I want to ask you a question this morning before we leave. Can you say that that's what your life is about? Doing justice loving mercy, and walking humbly with your God. By the way, humility is not putting yourself down. That's false humility. Humility is dependence on God. That's what real humility is. Humility is me saying, you know what, without God, it ain't going to happen. Never would, never will. But I have God, and I can depend on Him. And He told me that we can get this thing done. Amen? Listen, We've read the end of the book. It doesn't tell us things are going to get better and better and better until we reach this utopia here on this planet. It's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. But you know what? I am not going to stop resisting the devil just because a bunch of people want to follow him. And neither should you. How do we resist the devil? We live our lives by the truth of the Word of God. We use our authority to stand in the gap for people. We stand up for people who are disenfranchised, for people who are forgotten, for the invisible people that are all around us every day. We take their side because God loves them and nobody else seems to. Do justice. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. Let me pray for you before we leave. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and faithfulness. I thank you that you have made 
this life here on this earth. To be really pretty simple. We do what you say, <laughs> and we're going to get what you promised us. This is not, really not confusing. We have to have preachers that seem to want to confuse us to teach us that it's just not how it works. We thank you that you're faithful, Lord, and that you love us so much you sent your Son for us. Help us to display His glory and His beauty in our lives by doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with you. I thank you that you're helping us to do that, that you've given us all things that pertain to living a life of godliness. Show us, Father. Teach us. Continue to reveal to us how to use those tools. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.